Good evening, everybody. My name is Steve Tinney, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Penn Museum. Uh, thank you all for coming to this, our last great lecture for this year. Uh, tonight, my introduction is going to be a little different. Uh, perhaps that's a relief to those who come here often. Um, because as our Great Beasts lecture series draws to a close, we are pleased to announce great plans for this historic auditorium. See what I did there? Since it opened in 1915, the Harrison Auditorium has remained one of the largest spaces on campus, a go-to venue for university and community functions alike. Hosting lectures by preeminent scholars to family program performances, such as those held at the museum's annual World Culture Days, to town halls with our elected officials, this is a space that enables education, inspiration, and engagement. Beginning in early 2018, this auditorium will undergo a much needed and significant renovation. We'll be adding improved lighting, new seats, and important accessibility improvements, including direct elevator access. Yes, exactly. You are welcome. This project will be made possible by the museum supporters, and as people who have been part of this auditorium story, we welcome you to be one of the first to name a seat and take part in this history to come. For a gift of $2,500, your name or the name of an honorary of your choice will be installed on an elegant metal plaque on the back of a new seat in the auditorium. Payment can be made in three, up to three installments with a final payment to be received no later than September 30, 2019. We are calling this opportunity, as you see, take a seat and you can see some contact information up there on the screen. Uh, if you have a pen or a phone, jot that down. Uh, if all else fails, uh, call the museum, email us, call me, email me, uh, and we'll make sure you're connected with the right people. Um, we hope you will consider participating in the transformation of this beloved space. I think it's gonna be a huge improvement. Now, of course, this has an impact on next year and the great series will be moving home, we think, to Rainey Auditorium. Uh, we're still working out some of the de ticketing details, so please stay tuned for an announcement about that in August. Although we have not formally approved the topic for next year, and I am not really allowed to tell you this, what can I tell you, I'm a maverick. I'm going to let you know anyway that next year's greats lectures will feature great cities and we'll have some tie-ins with the opening in April 2018 of our much-awaited new Middle Eastern galleries. Please don't tell anyone I told you this. Thank you. I count on your discretion. So, this has been a long enough introduction already. I'm going to skip the usual stuff about the microphones. You all know it anyway. And get straight to tonight's speaker, Dr. Adam Smith. Adam received his PhD in archaeology from the University of California, Los Angeles, with a dissertation entitled Writing at Anyang, the role of the divination record in the emergence of Chinese literacy. Prior to that, he took an MA in archaeology at Peking University, China, with a dissertation on stone coffin burials of western Sichuan, northwestern Yunnan, and eastern Tibet. Adam is currently assistant curator in the Asian section of the museum as well as Assistant Professor of Chinese in the Department of, Eastern, of, of, of East Asian Languages and Civilizations. Uh, on a personal note, it always gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce our curators in this series, and I have to say that Adam is particularly active, particularly knowledgeable, particularly committed to the museum, and is a very highly valued and esteemed colleague. So thank you, Adam, for all you do. I could say more, of course, but I know that we are all really waiting to hear from him about our great beast's topic tonight, Tomb Guardians, the story of the Chinese winged lions in the Penn Museum. And so without any further ado, let us give a warm welcome to our speaker, Adam. Thank you, Steve, very much for the very warm introduction for you and to you all for, um, for coming and for the very warm welcome. Can everybody hear me okay? Always the first question. I can, I can, there we go, that sounds too loud. I'll speak up a bit and maybe a little bit of volume from the system as well will be enough. Can everybody hear me now? Okay, very good. Um, I want to talk about um, object, two objects in the museum that you can't fail to have noticed if you've ever been into the Chinese rotunda. There's one of them. 
They're the biggest and oldest stone monuments from China in the museum. And they're ones that um, I've recently been working on and have um, discovered there's a very, very interesting story to be told that for most of the time they've been here, we haven't been as aware of as we perhaps should have been. But let's take a closer look at the monuments first of all. There's our first one, a closer view. Now, a bit of a word about terminology. There are lots of names for these things. Um, if you look at the label in the gallery, it will tell you it's a Qilin. And that's a name that has a long history of use in China and outside. Um, but it, in some ways, it's a, it's a problematic word. Now, what they were really called originally and why they were called that is a very complicated and interesting question, but not one that I'm going to deal with this evening. So we're going to go for a very simple descriptive term, winged lion. Right? You'll see the word chimera is another common descriptive term. We're going to call them winged lions because they're felines, almost certainly lions, and they have wings. They've also got horns, but I haven't put that into the name. So there's the first one. Take a quick look at that before I move on to the next one, because the question is, what's the relationship between them? There's the second. They're not the same, right? They're, they're not identical. And the question is, what is the relationship between the two? The most obvious difference are those... Um, the, the ribs that run across the chest. On one, they're horizontal, on the other, they're vertical. So are they actually a pair, pair at all? Um, there's a closer look at the, the ribs on the front of this one. Well, to answer that question, we need to look at a couple of photographs that we normally wouldn't, you wouldn't expect to find on the front cover of Expedition or, or, or on, a, on a museum catalogue. Um, but my, I'm very grateful to my colleague Steve Lang for taking a couple of, going, un, going into the underbelly of this piece and taking a couple of photographs. This one, the, the sculptor has left us in no doubt at all this is a female, and that this one is male. Not such a clear shot there, but I think there's no doubt in your mind about that. So those differences that we've been looking at, you, you now know how to, how to sex a winged lion, but, the, but, um, but the, the, those differences that we were looking at just now, the, the ridge strut, they're all correlated with the, the sex of the animal. One other difference that's, that's sex-linked, if you're looking at um, uh, winged lions, are the number of horns. The male um, gets only one, whereas the female gets two. And in fact, this, uh, we'll see that there are other examples in China of these monuments. They also have the same set of repeating correlations between the sex of the animal and its traits. OK, does anybody recognize this man? We should all know, since so many of the items from China that are in our collection came through this man's hands. Now, as you probably know, in the early 20th century, when um, the, the great museums of the, of the United States and of Europe were anxious to acquire Chinese items, they did it through the market. There was unlike um, the items from the ancient Near East that you can see in our collections, many of which were um, acquired through fairly controlled archaeological work, the, the situation with China is very, very different. And of course, some of these items are already in private hands. Others were removed in ways that we wouldn't countenance today by removing them from their original sites. And that's what this man did. In some ways, he's the, um, the, the man who, more than anybody else, shaped the, the great US collections of Chinese art by acquiring items. Now, he, so our two winged lions come from him. They were, they were acquired by him and sold to the Penn Museum in the 1920s. Um, and uh, that, of course, leaves us with a problem. Items that are acquired in that way have less of a story than ones that have an archaeological history, a, a, a history that's been uh, discovered through, through scientific control, controlled excavation. Um, and so in 1928, in the first serious study of these items, Oswald Siren, the art historian, had this to say. Some of these, let's say some of these stone, these winged lions, still stand in their original places at the mounds of emperors and princes, which have been identified by several scholars. But others, of somewhat smaller dimensions, have been torn from their pedestals and exported to the Occident. Every possible precaution being taken, of course, and he's writing with some irony here, right? Every possible precaution being taken, of course, against any detailed investigation of their original position. In the matter of these last, therefore, we're left exclusively to a stylistic analysis for the determination of their position in a chronological series. So the, and that's, of course, what he proceeded to do. He began to compare um, winged lions like the one in uh, the, pen the, the pair in the Penn Museum with, with others that are from, from known sites in China. Probably the most famous of those groups of, 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 of winged, stone winged lions in China are the, are the very large numbers that, that, are, that are, um, are at the, the mausoleums of the southern dynasty's emperors. And there's one on the, on the screen there. So this is, this, he, he, that emperor died in 494 CE. And those are, that's, the, that's a stone lion standing in the original site, close to the original burial place of, of, of Emperor Wen of the Southern Lian. But the ones in the, up, upstairs in the rotunda um, 
are stylistically rather different from these, and as we shall see, there's quite an interesting, they're, they're actually quite far removed in time and in location from um, the Southern Dynasty's examples, which are the most famous. The first really successful study to elucidate the, the, the typological development of these um, uh, winged felines over, these Chinese winged felines over time, and to get us a date for the ones up, upstairs, was done in 1980 by Barry Till. And he had this very um, interesting sentence um, without any further justification. He said, the information which accompanied these animals to the museum states that they came from Neqiu County in northern Hunan. Now, we know where that is. That county is that county's still, um, still there. It's actually in southern Hebei rather than northern Hunan, but, but it, that's just across, the, across the, the provincial border. I have no idea what the, the source is for this claim, but it's crucial to um, the story that I'm about to tell. As far as I know, the museum archives have no record of this at all. It may have come from C.T. Lu's archives, which also survive in three different, three different locations today. That's where Natio County is. If you got a, does my pointer work? Yes, it does. So Natio County is all the way up there, a long, long way away from the southern dynasty's imperial mausolea down in Nanjing and Dantou, down there, so a long, a long way away. Here's another puzzle. Have a look at that photograph. Clearly a winged lion, of, of a stylistically comparable winged lion, but not either of the two that are upstairs. But where is it? Look at the background of the photograph. Where is it? Upstairs, right. So there was once a third winged lion in the building um, that's now no longer here. Well, in fact, it went back. It, it was also in the, in the, in, in the possession of C.T. Lu and went back across the Atlantic and is now in Paris, where it's a, a, a part of the collection of the Musée Guimet. And as you can see, again, stylistically similar, male or female? Can you remember? female, right, with the horizontal chest ribs, as, as far as I'm aware. It probably has, we would expect it to have two horns, can't tell from that photograph, but it's got the female horizontal chest stripes. So we've got, there weren't just two, there were three, and they were all from the same dealer, and, and potentially all from the same site, and they're all stylistically similar. If you've got three, they always come in pairs. Where's the fourth? Well, that's what we're going to have a look at. So let's have a look at a few more photographs of this one. There's the female one in the Musée Guimet. If you ask the Musée Guimet for study photographs, you get back things with squares on like that. So that's oh, just so you know why, why that's there. Uh, one more shot of the Musée Guimet, a winged feline. This is the only photograph that we have of the pen winged lions before they left China. Now, from the way in which they're positioned, they are probably not in situ, as it were. They've probably already been moved, but what they're, because they're intended to face each other across, across the spirit road up to the, up to the tomb. Um, but where they are in this photograph, I've, I've, I'm not sure. I suspect they're on their way to the railway line, which is how they would have been removed um, to, the, to, the, to the port when they were taken out. Um, this photograph, I, I, I would also very much love to find. It appears in Oswald Siren's 1928 article, but it's, not, again, not in our archives and possibly in C.T. Lewis. It's the only photograph of them before they left China. Um, now, uh, I think it's very important. I don't, I we don't normally have detailed footnotes in, in, in public lectures of this kind, but I think it is very important to mention a few names of people who've actually helped crack this story, who've contributed to the telling of where the, where the Penn Museum's um, wing, stone winged lions from China actually came from. This chap on the screen, Wang Lu Yu, he um, had, had the perfect idea of going back to Neqiu County and interviewing villagers about memories and memories of their grandparents, about the removal of stone. If you had a couple of, or three, stone-winged lions of that size in your village, even if it was a couple of generations ago, you would remember. Um, so he did exactly the right thing, and in 1987 published his results. And this is, what he, this is what he found. His report included accounts by locals in the county of the removal in the early 20th century of three flying horses. That was, what, that was their term for it, fema in Chinese. Um, from the villages of Wuzun and Shivanzun, which are both close together within the county. Those villages are seven Chinese miles apart, so that's about two or three miles. Um, so close together. Um, he, was also, he also suggested that these are in fact the three, because he'd read Barry Till's 1980 article, right? So he had this lead that there was, should be something from in, in nature to be discovered. Um, and he, uh, he identified them with the two upstairs and the one in the music he made. It gets even more interesting. In 1952, according to the villagers that he interviewed, a fourth, remember there should be one more, right? They always come in pairs. A fourth so-called flying horse at Shrefansen was discovered 
followed by its immediate reburial. Now, remember 1952, that's just after the revolution, difficult times. They may also have been motivated by a desire to prevent the loss of, of, a, of a fourth um, monument. So it was followed, its discovery was, its accidental discovery was followed by its immediate reburial. And then it was lost. The location in which it was buried was not recalled and then presumably the people who were involved died um, or passed on and nobody knew where, what, where, what had become of it. And there's a happy ending to the story. In 2005, the, the publication by Ju Jianqiang, the missing lion, the wing, missing wing lion shows up. In 1999, during uh, some sort of um, earth movement exercise, the fourth one was rediscovered by accident um, in the village of Shufang. So, and it's a perfect pair. It is said by everybody who's looked at the photographs. I don't think anyone's done a really careful study, but it's, it's, it looks like a very good match for the Musée Guimé piece. And there it is, still in Nature County. So a very, very happy ending to that story of the, of the, of the missing fourth, fourth winged lion, which is there, as you can see, stylistically very similar. You tell me what you think. Is it a perfect pair? Is it the one on the left is male, right? The horizontal, whoops, the horizontal chest stripes, and the one on the right is, is, our, is the female of the pair. And there's one more comparative shot. So, who owned these things? We've got two pairs, that means two individuals. Somebody must be buried there who, for whom these, these items were made. So, the next step in the story is the tomb, close to the, the, um, the village where they, they, were, they were all four discovered is the remains of an earthen tumulus that would originally have covered a tomb. Now, this monument has suffered very badly. I, I understand, it's, although it's never been subject to a formal report, there are discussions of it, of it occasionally, and apparently it was destroyed in the 1960s. I suspect more through neglect than through deliberate destruction, but, it, but very little uh, remains of the original earthen mound. But what, so what you can see on the screen is actually a very tiny proportion of what would originally have been a very, very large monument of the kind that one might expect to have accompanying stoned wing, winged lions. Um, something, a, a resource to which we can always turn under these circumstances when trying to figure out what a local, who a local monument might have belonged to are the, the, what are called the county gazetteers. And Chinese counties have maintained for many centuries records, sort of encyclopedic descriptions of what's to be found in the county, including ancient monuments. And this tomb mound is mentioned, and the stone lines are not, but the, the tomb mound itself is mentioned and discussed in the county gazetteers, going back to, to the Ming Dynasty. And they tell us that this was the two, though they in fact have two different accounts, two candidates for who might be the occupant of this tomb. The first one is unlikely and for various reasons is too early for our purposes, so we can probably rule that one out. But the second is of about the right time, a, a, war, a self-made warlord, a bandit warlord who emerges from complete obscurity to become the most powerful man in this part of the world at the time of the collapse of the Eastern Han Dynasty, so around about 200 CE. He emerges from complete obscurity, no, he, had no, he had no lineage to speak of at all, and yet he dies as the most powerful man in this part of the world. And his biography survives, as with most prominent figures in Chinese history, the, 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 the contemporary histories have kept a very detailed biography from which we can learn about this man. Um, uh, I'm going to read you a few little excerpts that I've translated from that biography because it gives you a flavour of who the owner of these monuments might have been. So when the yellow turban rebels arrest, so they're, they're part of the process of the collapse of the, of the Eastern Han Dynasty. They're, they're called yellow turbans because that's what they wore on their heads, but they were, they were a, a, a popular uprising that helped bring the dynasty to, it, to a close. When the yellow turban rebels arose, and that's in 184 CE, Yen, that's the guy we think is buried in the tomb, gathered a group of youths to form a band of robbers who would make roving attacks among the hills and swamps. When he returned to Junding, that's his place of birth, it was with a mob of thousands. Zhang, Cao Horns, and Yojiao had raised a mob of his own. Bandits in China have names like that. Zhang, Cao Horns, and Yojiao had raised a mob of his own, and claiming that he was leading troops in service to the emperor, he joined with Yen. So this, this robber band has emerged out of nowhere at a time of social chaos and is beginning to grow. The ranks of his followers swelled. The numbers reached a million, and they were known as the Black Mountain Rebels. Emperor Ling, that's one of the, 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 very, the towards the end of the Eastern Han Dynasty, was unable to campaign against them, and the commanderies north of the Yellow River, that's the region where we've been looking at on the map previously, suffered under them. Yen sent an emissary to the imperial court, requesting to submit to imperial authority, and was honored by the emperor as court gentleman, General Yen, who calms troubles. I guess that's the kind of title you hand out when a dynasty is collapsing. Um, court gentleman, General Yen, who calms troubles. 
He was honoured by a subsequent ruler as general who calms the north. He led his troops to the city of Yir, that's a, that's a hundred kilometres south of where the, 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 the location that we've been looking at, and was enfiefed as Marquess of Angorting, that's another place name, 160 kilometres northeast of where, where the tomb is, with a fief of 500 households. When Yen died, his son Fang inherited the title. When Fang died, his son Rong inherited the title. So not only has this individual appeared out of nowhere, but he has progeny, he has grand um, descendants. Uh, his sons continue, continue his title of Marquis of, of, of Angorting. So the earliest of the uh, winged lions are presumably his. his. His forebears were not the kind of people that would have had monumental architecture at the monu monu monuments outside there too, but his sons were. So the later ones, are this, these are likely to, the, the four that we've seen so far were likely to all have belonged to members of this lineage. Those are some of the locations. And remember that his title was, right at the end, his title was Marquis of Angwating. His hometown was there. Wutsun is where the, the, the pen-winged lions come from. Yingtao is another location mentioned in his biography. Years, the city where, that was also mentioned in that passage I just read. So as you can see, he, was re his, he and his huge growing band of rebels were really in control of this, this large area of North China here. There's the, there's the um, Eastern Han capital in Doya. Right? So he was the most prominent individual in his time in that region. That's the kind of person that gets stone-winged lions outside there too. So now let's start looking at some other examples. Having answered the question of where are the ones upstairs from, and all of this, remember, is relatively recent information. It, in 1980, when Barry Till was writing, he had no idea about um, all of these um, discoveries to come. But let's look at another comparative example. Here's another one, as you can, uh, male or female? I suspect people, assuming that the convention is always the same, right? Not, not every reporter of these items is as careful as I am to document the, the genitalia of the animals, but um, I, and I suspect that this is a female example with horizontal um, breast stripe, uh, ch chest stripes, and uh, we would expect two horns. Now, this one belonged to um, another lineage. There's, again, there's more than a single pair in this case. Um, and again, of known individuals. The man was the, the governor of Hunan, which is one of the most um, elevated positions in the official um, administrative hierarchy under the Eastern Han Empire. So he had obtained his status through a more conventional route of advancement through the, through the, um, the, the, the Han bureaucracy, and he came from a long line of officials. Now, his stone lines have been known about, have been continuously observed for at least a thousand years. There are Song Dynasty accounts of these monuments that you can see illustrated on the screen now and um, uh, reporting accurately who they belong to. So they're very, very well known. There's a pair of them, as you can see again, a male-female pair from that same location that belong to his family. Here is our only, um, so I suppose the next question is, well, where did they get this idea from? Remember we said that China, I, I, actually I'm not sure that I made that clear right at the beginning, but China has no deep tradition of monumental stone sculpture. Um, bronze is, yes, a writing system that goes back to 1300 BCE, a complex civilization that, that goes back even further than that. And yet, within all that, there are, no, there, there are no examples of monumental stone sculpture to speak of at all, including monumental stone buildings, so utterly unlike the ancient Near East. And yet, at this time, we first begin to see them. So, so my question, I suppose, next is where does this idea come from of winged lions outside the tombs of socially very elevated individuals? Well, given who they are, they're probably emulating emperors because that's what, that's what, that's what the, the next rank in the, so, in the, in the social system li likes to do. The one on the screen now is probably the only known example of an imperial winged lion. It it's almost certainly belongs to the, the tomb complex of the first uh, of the Eastern Han Empress. So that's right at the, that's towards the beginning of the first century CE. So about 100 years earlier than the one we saw on the previous slide and about 200 years earlier than the, the ones upstairs. Beautifully preserved, as you can see, the reason being that it spent the last 2,000 years completely buried um, rather than as an above ground monument like the, like the ones you can see upstairs. So it suffered much, much less damage. Um, and, that, and this is probably one of the examples that people like Zhang Yan, the, uh, the owner of the, of the, of the, of the pen-winged lions, and uh, Zong Zi, the, uh, the, the, the governor of Runan, who I mentioned just now, they were probably looking at imperial examples like this and thinking, yes, we want those in front of our tombs as well. But let's push the story back a stage. Who were the Eastern Han emperors looking to? Where did they get the idea of having winged lions in front of their, in front of their tombs? 
Here's another gallery photograph. You can probably tell that it's a pen. You can probably tell that it's one of our winged lions, male or female. <laughs> Two horns and horizontal chest stripes. It's the female of the pair upstairs. Now, I don't know who took this photograph or what their intention was, but what can you see in the background? I think they were trying to make a point. Do you agree? Right, Assyrian. I heard the only word I heard was Assyrian, but you're on the right lines. I think whoever took this shot, the slightly unusual angle, I don't think they were trying to document the two, the double horns and the, I think they were trying to make a point about the relationship between these two um, stone monuments. As you know, those Assyrian monuments are no longer here at Penn. They're, um, they're now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, um, but they were here on loan I mean, until what date, I'm not quite sure. But there we go. There's a, there's a more, much more recent photograph of the counterpart to the one you just saw. Remember, one is, a, in fact, a winged bull, the one you saw in the previous shot. This one is the winged, well, feline below, below, the, below the neck, right? Um, from the palace of Ashurnasirpal II at Nimrud, so much, much earlier than anything we've been talking about so far, 9th century BCE. Now, that's a long way from the Eastern Han Dynasty. And so that's a long way in geographic terms. It's also a very, very long way in time. So if we're going to tell a story of transmission and of relationships between these, we've got a lot of gaps, a lot of, lot of data points we need to fill in on the way. So let's have a look at some of them. Um, in fact, uh, the other point I was going to make is that Till had already made exactly these kinds of observations. And in fact, Oswald Siren in his 1928 article had already noted these similarities, as, as Till summarizes. Oswald Siren had pointed out that perhaps the sources of the winged felines in Chinese art may be in Mesopotamian art, which came through Babylon and Assyria to Achaemenid Persia, and thence by way of Bactria found its way across Central Asia to China. So it's an old, it's an old notion. The question is how? What kind of social process is driving this transmission over a very, very long period of time? Here's a much more recent statement, and this is in fact a theory of what that social process might have been. How, how did, how did this, these, these massive monuments travel that huge distance? Um, uh, the theme of the winged feline in the Han imagination is a heritage of the warring states period. That's, that's the, the period immediately before the Han dynasty. A result of modifications by the nomads of the steppes. That's the point I want to draw, draw attention to on several themes borrowed from the Middle East. So here, here's the idea. Nomads move, and they carry objects with them. They are inspired by the great monuments that they see at the, at the major centers of the ancient Near East to make mobile, much smaller items in, in precious metals and bronze and so on, which they then move with them, uh, being, being much more mobile than the people who produce the monuments. And the objects themselves then become much more mobile. And once those reach China, the idea of a winged lion captures the imagination and they're blown back up to full size, and there you have them outside Chinese tombs. This is probably part of the process. There's no doubt that this winged lion motif is extremely widespread all the way from China to the Mediterranean. Um, so this is part of the process, but I'm actually going to try and give you a sense of, of an alternative to this account of, of, of mobile pastoralists carrying um, small items around. Um, but first, let's get back to some of our the best known examples of winged lions from the ancient Near East. This one is from Darius I's palace at Susa. So this is what, sixth century, three centuries later than the Assyrian one. So already this is an enduring tradition, right, in the ancient Near East. Two horns, notice, much finer wings than we've, much more, 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 more realistic, I suppose, wings than we find on the Chinese examples. But again, evidently a, a winged lion, and very, very similar in many respects to the, to the Chinese ones. Perhaps best known, the best known in situ pair of all are again Darius the first complex at um, uh, Persepolis. Uh, again, a, a bull on one side, and I, I, I'm not sure there's a lion or a bull on the other, but, but certainly winged quadrupeds in, in, the same, in the same tradition. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but also take a quick look at that. Let that kind of sink into your retina for a second, right? Because it's gonna, it's gonna come up again. A fluted column, right? Um, now, here's now the, the previous scholar who I quoted just a second ago, uh, Mich Michelle Pirazzoli Sestevans. She um, um, made the point that there are also small examples of these winged lions, which are obviously much more transportable, and that there are there are nomadic pastoralist populations in between China and the the ancient Near East who are more than capable of moving these kinds of items over those incredible distances. Here's an example of again an Achaemenid period uh, winged lion. Evidently the same creature as the one you see in the stone monuments, but in miniature. And here is an example from the, that's in the style that's, that's shared by a very broad group of pastoral nomadic 
populations all the way from north of China, um, all the way to to um, to uh, um, the, the edges of the edges of Europe. Um, again, take a quick look. Evidently winged, evidently feline, and evidently horned. Right. So this is again a, a, um, a, a tradition that's imitating, that's borrowing this idea of um, winged lions from from the major stone monuments that we've we've been looking at. Um, she dates here to the 4th to 3rd century BC, so actually fitting quite nicely in between the period of, the, of, of Persepolis and, the, and the, the Assyrian monuments and, and the Han period. So that's, the, that's her idea, that, that these, that these, these um, uh, via these intermediate mobile populations, these small items are traveling to China and then being blown back up to, to being full monumental stone objects. But there are a few other places we need to look at too. Again, back, back to stone. The early Buddhist monuments in India um, are also filled with winged lions. Not used for monumental purposes like we find at Persepolis and at Nimrud, but used for essentially decorative or ornamental functions. Um, as you can see, there is one here, it's part of a frieze, right? There's a, there's a, there's a winged lion here being, with its tail being pulled by the individual behind. Other examples, I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, partly because I know very little about them, but just to let you know that there's a, there's a, there's a deep tradition of, of the use of these winged lions in Indian monuments. I actually understand that one of the previous talks might have touched upon this topic, um, but, but I'm not going to anticipate that. Um, so again, a pair of winged lions at the top of a column, right? Um, one more example, right up there at the top behind the elephants, we, again, we've got winged lions appearing in essentially a decorative role. Another pair from the top of a from the top of a column again, all from the earliest set of the the the, the, the well-known early Buddhist monuments um, in, in India, and then one final one final example um, of winged lions in a again a decorative role going round a round on a on a on a on a pillar. Back to China. So, do you remember the slide that I asked you to kind of commit to memory? What's it got to do with this one here? Right, the fluted column. Now. It's only relatively recently that I've been looking at this particular period in Chinese history. I, my specialty is really for earlier periods. And so I didn't know much, a great deal about these monuments. And, this, and I hadn't really been looking at the, these photographs at all until quite recently. But I was absolutely bowled over to find that you freestanding columns, fluted columns in China, stone columns in China. I didn't realize there was such a thing. If you work on early, earlier periods, you've never seen anything like it. You've never seen anything remotely similar. China has columns, of course. Chinese architecture requires columns to hold up roofs. If you think of the Forbidden City or of any, any Buddhist temple, the roof is supported by structural columns, but they're always of wood. They're never of stone. There are no, there's no tradition of, 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 of weight-bearing stone columns in China. But there we've got what is evidently a, um, a freestanding fluted column in China. Um, and that's part of the story. Because in, for the Southern Dynasty's tombs, the, the fluted columns and the winged lions are part of a package. They go together. You can't have one without the other. And if that's true, uh, we, we need to come up with a different account of how these things reach China. Monumental stone columns are not part of the, the, um, the nomadic pastoralist inventory at all, of course, for obvious reasons. Some other um, explanation needs to be found for how these things reached China. Um, so let's have a look at some comparative examples. Oh, before we move on, I have to show you my favorite photograph of all, because in some ways it captures so much of China's transformation. And it's also just such a beautiful shot. Uh, an isolated, well, it's part of the Nanjing group, it's part of the Southern Dynasties group, although no one's quite sure who this, uh, whose tomb this belongs to. It's right there in the middle of what looks like an oil refinery. Beautiful photograph, um, you, you, which you can find online. Um, um, very, very wonderful photograph. Um, here's an early photograph showing what these fluted columns look like in situ. Now, I've chosen this one because it has its original capital, and this is important. It's got a lion sitting on the top and a large, that large umbrella-like capital that you can see on the top. Notice also that it's inscription-bearing. The, the, the occupant of the tomb is named in that stone panel that you see halfway up the fluted column. Uh, by the way, this is one of the earliest photographs to have been just right at the beginning of the 20th century this was taken. So, fluted columns and lion finials. Let's look for some comparative examples. Back to those early Indian stone monuments from the Mauryan period. Lion capitals on stone columns, freestanding, remember, freestanding stone columns is the thing. Freestanding co stone columns are a puzzle. The, point, the whole point of a column is to bear weight, is to hold up a roof. And yet, this tradition of freestanding monumental columns 
um, is shared by both the, the, the Chinese Mausolea and um, sites like the one we're looking at at the moment. There's another example from the, from the reign of King Ashoka, a lion, fini, a lion capped stone column, not fluted in this case. Um, there's another fluted one, and this, is, this has a great many typological similarities to the ones that we were looking at in Nanjing. Right? It's inscription bearing, has an absolutely fascinating inscription on it. It's fluted, it's in fact got the flutes changed at a halfway point with a band around, which is again very, very similar to the Nanjing examples. And it's got one of those, um, it's not as umbrella-like as the Chinese one, but it's evidently part of the same, the same idea. And originally it would have had an animal finial, because that's mentioned in the inscription. So look at the inscription. We don't need to go through every detail of this, but this is a well-known monument, by the way, um, with a date on it, so 113 BC. So that's about 200 years earlier, 300 years earlier than the stone lion, the winged stone lions upstairs. This is what the text says. This Garuda standard, so the Garuda would have been the bird up on the top of the pillar originally. This Garuda standard of Ashudeva, the god of gods, was erected here by the devotee Heliodorus. Where does that, does that sound like an Indian name? Heliodorus, where is he from? Well, in fact, he's from Pakistan, but it's a Greek name, right? He's from, from Taxila. The son of Dion, a man of Taxila, sent by the great Yona king. So the Yona as in Ionian. These are, these are, the, these are the, the, the legacy of Alexander's conquests and city founding in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the East, um, certainly with Greek names, um, but, but obviously uh, not, not, I mean, his, 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 the fact that it's a Garuda standard um, and his, the, 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 the god it's dedicated to is a very Indian god, so they're, 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 they're not everything about them is culturally Greek anymore, but they have many traits that are. And again, if we're thinking about fluted columns and connections with regions um, to the west, this is a very, very important point in our, point in our story. So sent by the great, if you like, Greek king Antialkidas as ambassador to King Kasiputra Bhagabhadra, the savior son of the princess from Varanasi. I, I, I don't know enough about the background to know what, what that means. In the 14th year of his reign, so there's the date, right? A few other Indian examples from the great stupra Senji, third century BC. They occur in China too. So, that's the, so to, to complete our story, we need to know when do these reach China and how do they reach China and are they really part of a package with the winged lions? They seem to be, if you look at the Nanjing examples, the Southern Dynasty's examples, they look to be very, you can't have one without the other. But those are relatively late. Remember, they're, they're uh, the earliest of 5th century, whereas the, the one we're looking at up, upstairs is only, is only 200 CE. This is the earliest fluted stone column with an inscription. In fact, it's the earliest stone column that I'm aware of in, in China, I, 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 it, it, the date is about right, 100 CE, so slightly earlier than the governor of Runan's winged lions, and about 100 years earlier than the winged lions that are here at Penn. It's got flutes, it's got a pair of winged lions tucked up under the, under the plaque on the top. Now again, the plaque is clearly analogous to the, to the inscriptional plaque that appears on the ones at Nanjing, naming the tomb occupant, and that's exactly the function of the, the, um, the, the, the plaque here. There's a, there's a close-up of it with the, wearing its inscription. It names the occupant of the tomb. Some other... Ex uh, right. And, and it's from that that we get the date. Oh, I'm also meant to draw your attention to the um, inscription. Because, again, we, we, one of the questions we're asking is, what kinds of people get these winged lions or these, these fluted stone columns? Notice this title. So it says, the, the inscription reads, The Spirit Path of the Late Scribal Assistant Qin. That Qin is his surname, of Yojo of the Han Empire. So Yojo is where he's from. A scribal assistant is kind of like a secretary. It's a, very, it's, a, it's a relatively lowly position. So why has this guy got a fluted stone column? Well, this question has been raised before, and the, the answer probably is because his son, for whatever reason, rose to great prominence in his turn, and by the time his father died, was able to afford a much more lavish funerary complex than his father would, by his own efforts, have been able to achieve. Um, whether there were any, as I said, there are two stone lions tucked up under the under the inscription on this monument. Whether there are any monumental ones or not, we don't know. The tomb is not known, only, only a few of the fragments of the stone monuments are known from this site. A few other quick examples, a terribly grainy photograph from an old report, but again, this is actually from the interior of a tomb, and again, a clearly a, a fluted column being used there, but covered with all this, this very complex decoration and ornament. This is a third century example, of again, with a fluted column marking a tomb with its owner labelled in the stone plaque on the top. Um, that's from the same century. And there's another dated example, a fluted stone column with the, 
with the, with the inscript, inscription tablet inserted into it, dated to 399 CE, so just before the date of the Southern Dynasty's monuments. So we've got a tradition of fluted stone columns going well back into the Han Dynasty, well back into the time we want to find them in order to connect them with the earliest stone lions, right? But they only seem to be part of an obvious part of a package once we get to the Southern Dynasty's tombs in Nanjing. Can we connect them at an earlier stage? Um, I'll come to that in a second. One more slide that I, I want before I get that. Suppose they really are part of a package. Suppose that they really, that these, 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 are, these are not coming via nomads through miniature versions, because there are no miniature versions of fruited stone columns. They have to be reaching China through something like direct eyewitness observation by well-placed, um, intellectually curious people who can actually influence the practice of, very, of, of emperors once they get back to China. And for that, for, for, to, 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 to understand those kind of processes, our only source is our text. We, we, the objects themselves are not going to tell us those kinds of stories. And there are accounts of embassies in both directions, um, but not, no detailed written eyewitness description of foreign stone architecture has survived until rather later. But I want to show you the first example that we do have of an eyewitness account of Indian monumental architecture written by a Chinese visitor who returned to China and then fulfilled that kind of role, that sort of intellectually engaged, influential role that I've been talking about, that I'm suggesting is responsible for this package reaching China. That's his route. Don't know whether you've seen it before, but an impressive journey even today to, to leave China and travel via the overland Silk Route through um, Taxila and various other places. Remember where, where, remember where um, the uh, uh, Heliodorus's pillar, the owner um, came from, was, uh, he travels through Taxila, he travels through, visits the major Indian monuments, um, the early Buddhist monuments in India, and would have seen all of those items that we showed on the previous screen, and then returns via the sea route, via Sri Lanka, all the way back to land in China, and then to be a courtier um, of the southern dynasties, just at the time when the um, stone columns and the um, uh, wing lines begin to feature once again as, as um, imperial monuments of the southern dynasty's tombs. This man was Fa Xian, so he's, he's our first, he's, he's one of those many Chinese or other East Asian monks who made these amazing journeys in all, for, for religious reasons, in order to acquire Buddhist literature and in order to learn from Buddhist teachers who were in India and in Central Asia, and in order to return with this knowledge and with, this, with this, this, these, these texts to continue the tradition of teaching them um, on the, after their return to China. And he um, returns to China, I think it's 419 CE. Right, so he's, this, this journey is made then. And he's left us written eyewitness accounts of Indian stone architecture, which are the earliest that have in fact survived. Now what I'm suggesting is that there, would, there were previous examples of this kind, and I'm really using him as an analogy. But let's have a look at some of the things that he remarked upon during his time in India. Three or four hundred paces north of the stupa, so he's a stupa is a, is a, is a relic site, um, uh, a, B a Buddhist relic site. So three or four hundred paces north of the stupa was the site where King Ashoka built the city of Niraya. In the middle of this site stood a stone pillar, also more than 30 feet tall, with a figure of a lion on its top. An inscription on the pillar gave an account of the reason for the building of the city of Niraya and the dates of the construction. Not as detailed as we'd like, but that's pretty good. That's an, that's an individual returning to China with a head full of images of foreign, archi foreign, foreign monumental architecture that he's, that he's uh, making available to a Chinese audience. One more. Behind the temple, a stone pillar was planted. It was 20 cubits tall and had a lion carved on its top. On the four sides of the pillar were engraved images of the Buddha, as lustrous and transparent as glaze. Once a heretical teacher came to contend with the monks for the right to live there. When the monks were defeated in argument, they swore in unison that if that place was really a dwelling for monks, there should be a miracle to prove it. When these words were spoken, the lion on the top of the pillar roared aloud to prove it. The heretic was frightened and withdrew in humiliation. So an entertaining story as well, but again, a description of monumental stone architecture of the kind that I'm suggesting must be responsible for the arrival of this package in China. The last detail. Now, um, I, I taught a lot of this material in a class a year ago, and one of the Chinese students in the class, I'm delighted to say, said, oh, you know, I live near there. I live not far from Neijiu County. When I'm back in the summer, I'll, I'll take a drive there and 
take some photographs, see what I can find. And in fact, we'd already heard that there was said to be the remains of a stone column at the site, but then it had never been published, there were no, no photographs. And so what I'm going to do, with his permission, I'm going to show you some of the photographs that he took while he was there. There we go. There is the stone column within a stone's throw of both the tumulus and where it's said the, the, the winged lions are said, to have, are said to have come. Now, I can't tell whether it's got flutes or not. As you can see, it's very, very badly weathered. But it's certainly a stone column of the kind that we would like to find associated at a very early date with winged lions. Until the archaeologists have, have brought this whole object to light, we're not going to know the full story. But my hunch is that this is connected with the, with the, with the, with the stone lions upstairs. A few other shots of that. Anyway, I was very, very pleased to find that um, a student in the class had been able to, do, to, to, to return with these wonderful photographs. There we go. There's a view across the cornfields from the site of the stone column to the, the, tum the tumulus. So that would have been the spirit road leading up to the, um, to the burial mound, assuming our story holds together. And if you're curious, I hope in a relatively soon to be forthcoming issue of Expedition, we're gonna, he, he and I are going to try and tell this story of the, of the winged lions at the Bear Museum. Thank you very much. And if there are um, questions or if there are slides that you'd like to see again or, or observations that you'd like to make, um, my time's yours. I, I, I don't have anywhere, anywhere I need to rush off to. So um, either, either we, could do, we could do it for out loud for a while or if you want to converse later, that's also fine. Any questions? Or observations? Very, very interesting question. So I don't know whether everybody heard it, but the question was, do we know for sure that the craftsmen who produced these columns and these stone lions were local? They were, they, they were, they were Han Dynasty Chinese. Um, I imagine they were, given that the, the items are presumably not being transported over long distances, so they're definitely made by people living there. And we don't have much evidence for any of the obvious candidates of imported crafts and working on them, but it's a very, very important question. It's a very, very important question. The other, I suppose the other important line of evidence for that is the fact that these things are all stylistically distinct. None of those, although I'm drawing attention to the similarities, right, the, the flutes on the columns, the, the inscription halfway up, the, the winged lions, none of those could be mistaken for a, 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 one of the, the items from elsewhere in the world, from India or from Persepolis. They're all, they're visually, they have lots of distinctions. I, of course, I've been trying to emphasize the similarities, but nobody would mistake one for the other. Um, so I suppose the answer is yes, almost certainly, by it's a, a native tradition has grown up, um, but one that's somehow aware of this um, Eur Eurasia-wide use of winged lions for monumental purposes. But yeah, very, very good question. Yes. How do you do? Are there, were there lions in that part of the world to right. provide any inspiration? Another very, very good question. I, uh, my understanding is that no. I mean, obviously, the, the, the historical distribution of species is different from how it is today, but there's certainly none today. And my understanding is that the, the, um, the lion has never been distributed in East Asia at all. Persia, yes. But further west, I understand not at all. But there, some people will know more about this than I do. Certainly, the Chinese word for lion, which is still the Chinese word for lion, which appears in Han Dynasty sources for the first time, should right, the for, for any Chinese speakers here. That's still the Chinese word for lion. It's there in our. Uh, it appears for the first time in Han Dynasty sources. Where in the accounts of foreign embassies that come back with exotic creatures and exotic gifts, lions are amongst those. Right? Um, and that name is, doesn't feel like a native Chinese name. It feels like a translation. In fact, in fact it is a, known to be a, a transliteration of a, of, a, of a foreign name, for a foreign word for lion. So yeah, again, another very, very good question. The animal itself is not native. Were there any mythological tales of Right. There are. There are. And they're, and they're extreme. I, I wish I'd actually refresh my memory about all those before I came, because I'm not going to be able to tell you any of them, but there are. The interesting thing is that they're all, they're all later than the monuments. They're all mythological tales about the monuments, not about the... So it's not as though you have tales first about winged lions, and then in response to those mythological narratives, you make the winged lion. That may be true in Persia, I've no, or in Assyria, I've no idea. But in China, there are no tales of winged lions. They do not feature in Chinese mythology or any other kinds of accounts. 
but there are lots of mythological accounts about the monuments either coming alive or, or, or doing supernatural things. I, I, can only, I can only remember one now, but it's, 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 a, it's not quite what you're asking, but it's close. I mentioned the ones that have been under continuous observation for at least a thousand years. Remember the two that, the, the set actually, that belonged to the family of the governor of Funan. So he was a second century, a very high ranking official who, whose family had a set of these winged lions. There's a Song Dynasty story of, because the Song Dynasty antiquarians were fascinated by these things and they wanted to, they visited the site and they wrote descriptions of them and they, they took rubbings of, of the inscriptions that they found. Um, and one of the stories that they tell is of, a, of an army encamped, which war I can't remember, but there was an army encamped in the vicinity of these uh, stone lions which bore inscriptions. And that by taking the, the inscription simply naming the, naming the creature with, the, with the, whatever the name of the, of the animal is, by taking a, the, the army had, uh, there was an attack of dysentery. I mean, there was, a, there was, a, there was a, a wave of dysentery within the troops and they were, all, they were all suffering from this. And the cure for it, the magical cure for it, was to take a rubbing of the inscription on the stone lion, burn it to ash and then ingest it. Make of that what you will. That's not quite what you were asking, right? You were asking about sort of, more ancient narratives, but that's the kind of, a lot of sort of supernatural tales grew up around the actual monuments rather than about the, the winged lions themselves, which if you think about, if, if this story more or less holds together of a, of a foreign arrival, it makes sense that there wouldn't be any ancient mythological narratives about these creatures, that they're relatively recent, used for symbolic purposes rather than for either religious or, or mythological for, uh, reasons. Any other questions? The, uh, the pillars seem to provide quite a practical <laughs> uh, solution to letting you know who it was. And Absolutely. Their sort of thing. But very much in the same vein, uh, you know, any, again, reason for them other than a decorative purpose? Yeah, is, I think is, the reasons... Is, I guess, are, unknown. Yeah, I, the reasons are, seem to be purely symbolic. I mean, the, the inscriptions all say essentially the same thing. So-and-so is buried here. They're like tombstones. They, they carry the same kind of information that tombstones that might be more familiar to us carry a, a, a date and, a, um, and an individual and a very short bit of their biography. Um, no, they, they're being used for their symbolic value, right? They're, they're being used because this has become the internationally recognized, it's an internationally recognized symbolic form. That's what you have at important monumental sites. You have winged lions, you have stone columns um, for no other reason than that. Why do we use fluted columns today, right? Why would, why, why would, why, why did, why um, did 18th or 17th century architects use fluted stone, fluted columns, either stone or in wood, in order to, for, you know the reasons, right? It's not, it's not because they're used there, they're particularly suited to any kind of architecture, they're used because of the, the associations that they have with the distant past. Same story here. About those pillars. Um, yes. Yes. Which ones in particular? Are there any particular you wanted? I'm more than happy to flick back through slides if no, you want. No, no. Okay. Uh, in India, right. the, the pillars um, are not just adventitious uh, to the stupa. The stupa itself had a pillar right up through the center. Right. That was, a, that was the fundamental part right. of the stupa or the burial mound itself. Yeah. There are, I mean, a lot of transformations have taken place right between these two cultures. Uh, first of all, the, the, uh, the, the Indian sites are all Buddhist relic deposit sites. That's what they are in, in, in essence. Um, whereas the um, Chinese examples that we've looked at, without exception, are all tombs of individuals, relatively recently deceased individuals. Right? So the, the nature of the two sites is completely different. But the same symbolic vocabulary has been, transformed, has been used in both cases and transformed across cultures to be used to be reused, to be recycled, if you like. Any other questions? Yes, I actually have two, two questions. Good. Uh, first, I miss the name of that person who, you said he shaped the, the American collection of uh, Asian art. Right. You showed his picture in the beginning. I did, yeah. And Let's go all the way back. It's, a, it's a very, it's probably his most famous photograph. <laughs> well, it's all the way back. There we go. Yeah, That's yeah. That gentleman. What mm. was his name? The surname is Lu. He spelt it L-O-O. -O. Okay. 
Um, his Chinese name was Lu Qinzhai. In fact, that wasn't even that, that was the name he took. Um, but C. T. Lu is how he's, he's, he's how he's labelled in the gallery, and that's how he's almost universally known um, in in the English speaking world or in Europe. When, when he when he was in business, that was the name he used, C. T. Lu. Okay, thank you. And Me? another question is. Um, are there any records or explanation why there were lions next to the burial grounds? Because, you know, like in Mesopotamia, they explained that the visitors were supposed to be in awe as they were walking down the, you know, towards the tomb. Or, for example, in Thailand, they have these creatures um, by the exit, and they're supposed to um, protect from evil spirits. So is there any explanation for these Chinese yeah. winged lions? Again, I think the the, the 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 monumentality of the tomb is the is the is the thing. The there's a the the the, the emphasis is on legitimate succession, um, and so the return to a, a burial site of a preceding monarch who's the ancestor of the current monarch, to reaffirm that legitimacy of lineage is very very important. So that's really the function they're they're serving there. For their producers, anyway. Then we have all these later people who are curing dysentery by, you know, they're using it for all sorts of other things. But the original, the, 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 those who conceived of the monuments were doing it for that reason, for the for the sim, their symbolic resonance in, in that kind of context, emphasizing legitimate dynastic succession. And remember, the southern dynasties have removed themselves from the north because of the of in, encroaching. Um, non-Chinese populations. That's why they've ended up in Nanjing. So, and, and there have been several breaks in the succession, and that's why it's a very, very big deal for them. So yes, legitimate, legitimate imperial succession. Are there any other questions? It's interesting that um, since you said there are no uh, records of these lions that play such a big part in Yeah. The, exo the exotic aspect of it might have been part of it, right? The fact that it was such an extraordinary creature that no one had ever seen. Maybe that's why, it, maybe that was part of the story. We, unfortunately, we don't have any sort of thick description of the psychology behind them by the people who created them or by the people who commissioned them. Yeah, maybe one day we'll be lucky, but that's just not the kind of text that we have. It would be wonderful to have that, to have someone justifying this choice of monument. I mean, obviously, if your dad did it and your granddad did it and you, you know, the, the emperor's going right back to the beginning of the dynasty, all died, it, all did it, then you'd, you'd continue to do this. That would be reason enough, right? But it would be nice to have some sort of sense of the psychological motivation behind this choice of these exotic, exotic monuments. Um, yeah, I get, that's one reason why I was looking at that monk's account, Fa Xian's account of his visit to India, because that gives you some sense of what, of seeing through someone's eyes foreign monuments and then writing about them or describing them for a, for a, for a domestic audience. But yeah, he's, he's, he gets back to China 200 years after the stone lions upstairs. So too late to be directly. OK, another very, very important question. Had, if I had um, a, another hour, I could have handled all of these. But there are, there are um, no, there are later examples. Um, in fact, it's the columns that you continue to see. If you, I don't know whether you can picture in your mind's eye Tiananmen Square. And remember, there's the palace at one end, Mao's portrait that still hangs there, with the um, with the former palace behind it, right? Um, somewhere in that scene, and that you've got in your mind's eye at the moment, are two um, freestanding stone monuments that are actually the descendants of these. Um, and there are the Song Dynasty mausoleum and the Tang Dynasty mausoleum have these kinds of things. The winged lion is, doesn't remain that prominent, but spirit roads with monumental sculpture going up towards the tomb persist. And part of that are these freestanding stone monuments. And there are um, a couple, I think, I think in Tiananmen Square. If you look at, well, just, if you just Google it and go to Google Images, you'd probably be able to see them in the first shot. Someone with somebody with a device can check it now. <laughs> um, but not just there, I mean, the, um, imperial sites or other, um, in fact, the, the university campus where I was in, in China was a former, um, it had been a sort of palace a complex, and that had a couple of those there. And they are descendants of these same, a uh, thousand years later, right? more than a thousand years later. Um, for those stone lions for which we have some kind of geographic knowledge where they came from, 
can we tell if they were made from local stone? I wish I knew that, yeah. I have, I, I'm not knowledgeable about those kinds of questions at all, and the work hasn't been done. But obviously this is a really crucial... There are lots of things you could do if you really wanted to get into stone lions and to really continue chasing this story. And first, the first thing that you could do would be to go around and really document them all in much greater detail. Photographs are fine. Lots of photographs are really, really good, including some of them. You know, they don't, they don't look very pretty, but some of the ones that I put up earlier on. Documenting them like that, so we really know exactly how these, how these sculptures are put together. Um, that would be really useful. 3D scanning would be incredibly useful. And with lots of photographs, that's actually quite easy to do now. So, for example, the claim that the one that turned up, what year was it? 1999, it was rediscovered, right? The claim that that one is, is an exact match, male-female counterpart, for the one in Paris seems good enough if you look at the photographs, but if one is really quite substantially bigger than the other, um, then no, and we don't have that. If somebody could do that, they're actually quite hard to measure because of their sinuous shape. What do you measure from where, to, from where to where? If somebody could, you know, that would be a wonderful project to do, is to actually go and 3D scan them all. You could start with the ones upstairs. In fact, we've already done the ones upstairs. Um, uh, that would be really, really good. And, and yeah, detailed photography of all the details. Looking at sculptural technique, right? Looking at how, I mean, again, I know nothing about sculpture. Um, I don't know anything about how a stonemason produces an item like that, or how you source the stone, or any of those questions, but all of that could be addressed. Um, yeah. So good, yours was about sourcing the stone, right? The, 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 the mineralogical qualities of the stone. Yeah, again, I just don't know anything about it, but somebody should do it. Any more? Thank you. It's very, very kind of you to say.